Hi there, and welcome to Weird Shit Episode 7, uh, Shading Part 2, Procedural Boogaloo. Now, um, this is a follow-up on the first shading episode, which I did a couple weeks ago. If you haven't checked that one out, uh, I would highly recommend it. Check it out on the channel. Um, but with that said, I'm going to jump right in and get straight into what we're going to do today. So before I get started real quick, um, again, we have three very basic models. Uh, Suzanne is once again our lovely model for the day. And in the world area over here, I just have a HDRI loaded in from the Blender Cloud. So this will all be included. And as usual, you'll be able to access the final file to have a look at it yourself. Um, I've taken away a lot of the stuff from the UI, like the properties over here, because we're not going to really use any of that. We're just going to focus on nodes over here and shading. So I'm going to set my viewport to rendered and let's dive right in, shall we? Um, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is shader mixing. So I'm going to do this. Uh, actually, let's see. I've got the floor selected. That's not what I want. Um, I'm going to remove this material and just grab Suzanne over here. And uh, I'm going to use some principal shaders. Uh, so just so you can get an idea of what you can do. And I have access to some of these um, settings a little bit quicker. Where are we? Principal shader. Come on. There we go. I'm going to duplicate it and just talk a little bit about how I mix stuff. So one of the things um, that I really like to do is mix a bunch of different shaders to get some really weird effects. Now we're going to start with a very basic one here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in this layer weight node. And we talked about the layer weight a little bit in the last one. So this generates sort of a Fresnel mask if you're setting it to Fresnel rather. Um, and you can use it to mix different things together. We did that to mix uh, a glossy and a diffuse shader to make our own very basic shader. Um, but I want to show you that you can do a lot more with that and go really, really far with it. So I'm going to grab these two shaders and I'm gonna mix these together using the uh, Fresnel node over here. So, or the Fresnel part of the layer weight node. So if we grab one base shader, and that should actually be in there, there we go. And grab the other base shader. Now they're both white, so we're not really going to see a difference. But what we can do is, let's say we want to uh, grab sort of a darker shader over here, bring down the color, and maybe bring this one over to blue. And you can see by tweaking the Fresnel node, um, you can get some really interesting results. Now, this is similar to something I did in the first one, but what I want to start talking about is actually something a little bit different and um, how to control this stuff a little bit more and how to use it in conjunction conjunction with textures. I just want to do this as sort of a refresher of what the Fresnel node does, but something that I really like um, is actually using this for regular textures. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete all this stuff. I'm going to keep the uh, Fresnel and let me think. I'm just going to Look at my cheat sheet very quickly here because I have some stuff prepared that I want to run through. So the first thing we're going to do is mix some maps together. Now, I'm going to hit up this shader. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to turn off the specular for now so we get a nice diffuse shader uh, with a black base color or near black base color. So I like to do a lot of texture stuff procedurally, uh, sorry, procedurally as well. Um, mainly because I'm a very lazy person and I really don't enjoy UVing. Um, these uh, monkeys don't have any UVs on them. I've turned off the default UV and um, I just want to show you the amount of stuff that you can do uh, and the interesting things you can do with it by just using these procedural textures. So I'm just going to control shift click this. Again, I have the node wrangler enabled. Uh, if you haven't got that enabled, enable it in the add-ons so we can see what we're doing. Now I have this noise texture and it seems to work pretty well. Just gonna solo this for a second and maybe turn off my background real quick. Where's my world here? Turn off the visibility. There we go, and then we can hide that. So now we can just see Suzanne in all her glory. Now, if you'd like to map this, um, you can hit Control T with the uh, Node Wrangler add-on enabled. And I'm not going to mention it anymore. From now on, a lot of the shortcuts that I use here um, are because of that uh, that add-on. So if we look at Suzanne now, you can see it's sort of generating coordinates. Uh, this is set to generated. And the way this works is if you're looking at her from the front, it's going to use the front left uh, as sort of the origin point and generate the texture out. So what I mean by that, if you scale this up, or down, you can see that it's scaling from the front left down here. 
So it's basically using the bounding box of the, uh, the object itself and then scaling it. So you can see it actually doesn't scale from the middle. And sometimes if you have really long or really weird objects, you can see here already gets a little bit warped. Um, the generated sort of doesn't take into account that your object might not be a perfect cube when it comes to its bounding box. So to get around that, um, we can either use UVs, but obviously I don't have any UVs on this and uh, I did this on purpose. So just to show you that I barely use UVs uh, most of the time. And um, what we're gonna do is actually we're gonna use this object vector. And now what you can see is if we scale this up and down, do the same thing, it's actually scaling from the middle. So now it's using the very middle point of this object um, or I believe it might even be the uh, origin point. So let me just see if I can back that claim up. If we move this up and we set this back. So now our origin point is under Suzanne and you can see it's actually scaling from that point. So I'm just gonna undo that. Where are we? Link nodes, there we go. Go back. So it uses the origin to uh, scale. So for this to work in sort of a more normal fashion, I try to make sure that my origin point is somewhere in the middle um, so it's a lot easier to work with. So now we've got that set up. This is really cool because now we've got this perfect procedural pattern. Perfect procedural pattern, wow. Um, and we can start doing some really interesting things with it. So some of my favorite things to use are obviously the uh, color ramp. So if you use the factor here, we just get a black and white output and we could actually increase the contrast, for example and start um, colorizing it and doing some really interesting things with it. So now we've got a red to yellow, um, almost lava-like texture. And there we go, we can throw it in the shader. We can just use it like that. Um, we can mess with the scale here. So something that might be a little counterintuitive in the beginning is that your scale, uh, as you're bringing it up, it actually scales down. And as you bring it down, it actually scales up. This is just something you'll get used to. Um, it's not really a big deal. But as you can see, we can do some really interesting stuff. And I don't have to UV anything. I don't have to worry about anything. There's no texture seams. It just works perfectly. Now, uh, if we crank up the detail, for example, you'll see that there's like a lot more extra little bits and bobs that show up here. So um, if I bring the detail down to one, you'll see it's just very blobby and detail down to 16 or up to 16, you'll see there's a lot more detail in there. And then distortion as well will distort this noise. So just with this one, one little um, noise texture, we can start doing a lot of really crazy things very quickly by piping it through a color ramp and colorizing it. We can do some really, really nice effects. And you can go really far by maybe adding more colors in between and you get these really psychedelic, um, weird looking things. But generally I use a few textures together and uh, try and get a really cool result from them. So that's what I'm gonna do next. Now, the only thing is, I'm gonna show this using a brick texture. And unfortunately, the brick texture does require UVs. So um, I'm gonna to have to unwrap this very quickly because if we just hit it now, then uh, by default, Blender is going to use the generated coordinates, so the ones we were using over here. Um, if we set this to object, for example, you'll see that it gets sort of, um, it gets projected from the top but the front doesn't look right. Um, and that's because the brick texture isn't like the noise texture. It's actually a 2D texture, which is trying to be protected in 3D space, but doesn't quite work. So this is one of the, um, I guess, the rare cases that I would use UVs. And uh, that's the reason I'm, I'm showing you this one as well, because you can do some really, really cool stuff with this brick texture. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna unwrap it by selecting everything in edit mode, hitting U and hitting Smart UV Project. Now, these UVs are terrible, okay? Don't take these as good UVs. Um, I'm just very lazy, but I just wanna show you very quickly that now if we hit Shift Z and would swap this over to UV, for example, now we're actually getting a nice UV projection um, with all the weird seams and everything that are in there. That's my fault, because I'm really lazy, but I don't really wanna unwrap it decently. Maybe we could very quickly if I just select a seam around here somewhere. And I'm sure there's plenty of people looking at this now that are better at unwrapping than I am and are just completely cringing. No, it's not worth it. I'm not bothered. Can we get around here? Let's see if we make that a seam. Uh, we try to unwrap everything now. Uh, maybe. Uh, let's see if we minimize the stretch on them. A little bit. See what happens. 
Okay, so they don't look great, but you get the idea. And we can work with this just fine. So I'm gonna bring up the scale to begin with, and now we have sort of this really weird warped brick texture on Suzanne. But um, I'm not really talking about how to make this, uh, trying to make this look good, but what we can actually do with it. So one of the things that you might notice is that in order to make this a complex texture, I'd like to start things as simple as possible. So I'm gonna turn down the motor size and turn on the offset. So I just have a basically a square pattern once I set this to 0.5. And now we just have a normal square brick pattern. Now, because of our UVs, it's getting stretched and being weird all over the place, but you get the idea. Now, with this pattern set up, um, you, what you could do is if you hit Control Shift D and you duplicate this node, then you get the same uh, connection as the previous node. So you don't have to wire everything up again, which is really nice. But you could either pipe your uh, colors into here. If we make this bigger, then you'll see that we have um, one set of colors that has the bricks in it and the other set of colors that just has the emptiness in it. So that has that regular color in it. So if I set this to black, for example, and I set these to uh, white and white, and sort of light gray, and you can see, actually, I'm going to set it to black. There we go. You can see you already have a pattern that has more intricacy to it. Now, you could keep going or you could just up the scale and get some really crazy stuff and do some really cool things with this. But um, there's actually something else that I really like to do, and that is using textures to mess with the texture coordinate of other textures. Now, there's a complete variety of ways on how to do this. Um, if you go look at the Space VFX set of tutorials from A.D. Burroughs and Gleb Alexandrov, they have a whole section on it with really advanced techniques. Um, the way I do it is kind of ghetto, but it works for me, and I kind of know um, how everything works. And I'll, uh, I'll have another resource for you in just a minute. But the way I do it is I grab this vector math node over here and I literally, I'm just gonna undo this so we have our regular checker texture, our grid texture again. And uh, I literally just pipe the color of this into the add. And what you can do now is by putting a math node in between here, you could sort of have it affect it not as much. And as you can see, it does some really cool things. Let me just change something in the render, render settings real quick here. Uh, if we go to properties, performance, start at 256, then we can see a little bit better. It doesn't always go completely blocky. So now you can see uh, when I mess with this, either when I mess with the multiply value, you can see our original brick texture. It's not just putting the, um, the brick color inside of one of the colors, but it's actually messing with the coordinates. So you get these really irregular, weird looking things. And this is where it gets super interesting. So let's say I set this to like 22 or make it maybe a little bit bigger, or not the mortar size, but the scale. But the cool thing is now you can see it changing interactively. And you can also see that this uh, pattern is becoming more complex. It's not quite as perfect. It's got some really weirdness, uh, some nice weirdness to it, some imperfections to it. And that's something that I really like about using procedural textures. Because you're able to actually have them affect the, the textures themselves, you can do really cool stuff. So what happens if we hit up the mortar in this one, in this one, for example, now we can get these really weird, crazy patterns. So now we have this original brick pattern that you see, then we have it displaced by this brick pattern. And then somehow the mortar is making it all into a grid. And depending on the colors um, that you're using, because at the end of the day, UV coordinates are just um, RGB colors. And uh, the other resource I was talking about is a blender conference talk about uh, from Bartex Garupa about how controlling your texture setups um, and your UV coordinates with colors and by using math. And you should definitely check that one out because it is absolutely mind blowing. He makes like a procedural wood pattern for a floorboard and you can see all kinds of crazy tricks that you can use. Um, and some of the ones in this tutorial actually derived from there are the ones are ones that I, I picked up myself, but it's a really, really great resource. So let's see if I bring down the mortar smoothing because that does do weird things I've noticed. Uh, you bring this up and you get this really weird sort of psychedelic vibe. But then again, if that's what you want, then you can do some really cool stuff with it. So all we've really done so far is just grabbed a brick texture and um, added in the other brick texture into the uh, coordinates for the first one. Now, this is not a very scientific way of doing it. I kind of know what I'm doing in the background. Um, I'm not going to explain the whole thing because we're going to be here for a long time. 
but um, it's good to know that you can use textures to affect other textures. That being said, rather than using the brick texture, we could just pipe in the, um, the noise texture and here you go. Now you get this sort of almost camouflage pattern because what's happening is if I set this down to zero, you can see we have this grid and then the noise itself is actually gonna start pushing that grid around and creating these really, really crazy shapes. And depending on the amount of distortion that you use, let's say if we set this back to zero, and the amount of detail that you use, um, I'm gonna bring the scale down a little bit, so setting it to five, you can get these crazy complex patterns without actually having to do anything. Um, same goes for if we were to change this one into a, let's say, let's try something else. Um, Let's try Musgrave Texture. Now this Musgrave Texture is notoriously hard to get the hang of, I found, um, but you can do some really cool things with it. But then again, if we just pipe this vector into it, then again, you'll see that once we start messing with the detail and the distortion on this one, we have that Musgrave Texture being affected. And if we really wanna be fancy, then um, we turn off the UVs here, set this back to object. And now we have textures that are perfectly aligned, uh, per non, like, have no seams, are completely procedurally generated and uh, projected onto the mesh. And with this kind of stuff, you can get some really, really crazy results. Um, again, let's say we go completely nuts and we pipe this factor into the color ramp. And now we have a really crazy procedural texture with a bunch of crazy colors in it. And we can do some really, really cool things with it. So that just goes to show that um, sort of messing around with these and playing around with them is really important because even if you're a texture nut or a UV nut or you wanna to go to a game engine, we still have these UVs that we created earlier. We could just go into our baking tab over here and actually bake these down into a texture. Uh, here we go. We'd actually bake these all down into a texture. So let's say I just have the diffuse, direct, and I hit bake. Uh, oh, we need an active image. I'm not gonna get into that. You'd have to add an image texture and create it and then bake it into there. Um, there's plenty of baking tutorials, but what I'm trying to say is that you could actually have this and um, bring it into GIMP or Creator or Photoshop or whatever it is that you use and then paint in extra details. So if we go back to the shader and we set up the specular a little bit, now we have this really crazy psychedelic thing going on. Um, again, we could use the brick texture instead but we have to make sure that now we set it to UV. So it respects the UVs. And as you can see, like if you're gonna try and paint this in and make it look good, it's gonna take ages. But if we just do it in Blender, it looks just fine. Um, and you could even bake it down and do stuff with it if you really wanted to. So textures affecting textures, it's crazy. Um, you can go really hard on it and have a lot of fun with it. And uh, just like in the last lesson, I actually have a bunch that I create and um, I'm always making more of these. So this is a really good example is the wood grain, or not the wood grain, sorry, the grid, um, which basically describes a lot of the techniques that I just talked about. So uh, if we open it up very quickly, while this seems quite, quite complicated, all that's happening is there's a brick texture affecting the uh, coordinates of a brick texture, which is in turn that with its affected coordinates affecting the UV coordinates of the, um, or whatever coordinates you pipe in to the node of the final brick texture. So by showing you um, what I had earlier here, if we now look at this and I set all of this to zero, then as you can see, it just starts from a normal black and white pattern that can change here, just the way that I did before with these ones. Um, and I can use, actually this one only works once these are in place. So I can use one to start displacing, another one to start displacing a little bit more. I can change the scale up and down dynamically. I can change the color bias to have more darker colors or more lighter colors. Um, and then I can have, and if you know what's happening here, if you remember when we were doing this over here, all I'm doing here is just increasing the size of the mortar basically internally, and that in turn uh, makes it an even more complex grid. And you can just keep going and going and going. Um, I can move whatever's behind the grid. I can add in sort of greeble lines, uh, which is again, another layer of mortar lines that we can use. 
And then that mortar smoothing that I talked about, I called it madness in this one because I like the way it uh, it really messes with the colors around the edges and does weird, weird things with it. But as you can see, now we've got this really complex pattern very quickly and we didn't have to do a single bit of texturing. Um, which brings me on to the next point. So I'm gonna go back out here. Let's uh, maybe leave this for what it is. And what I'm gonna do is with these texture coordinates down here, I'm just gonna move them down here. I'm gonna stick them into this displacement slot and then you'll see you get these really cool uh, bump and displacement effects by just using these procedural nodes. Now again, the brick texture is sort of the one of the ones that's the odd one out um, because it needs a UV. So definitely look up which ones do and don't work uh, with and without UVs and try to use the object rather than generated uh, coordinates if you're gonna do non-UV stuff because it generally just works a little bit better uh, in my opinion and uh, you don't have to worry about stretching as much with the generated uh, with the object coordinate uh, coordinates rather than the gener generated coordinates. Whew, wow, that was a lot. Okay, so let's get back to our main view here. And with that grid, I'm just gonna add in a math node, set it to multiply so we can control the amount of bump. And there we go, now we've got crazy bumps all over it and a crazy uh, texture. And I didn't really have to do anything. I didn't have to go into GIMP and I have this really nice complex looking texture. Um, that being said, it's all good and well, but what if you wanna use these and actually use them for something proper? What can you do and what are the extra tools that you can use to um, really make some cool looking things and do some interesting stuff? So for that, I've selected the middle one here. I'm gonna ch change this out with the principal shader as well, just for the sake of speed. Um, and I, I have found that they give really, really cool reflections. I must admit, um, the shaders that I build myself don't always look as fancy as the principled. Um, but yeah, I talked about that a little bit in the other video. Um, I'm just using these for speed and because they look really nice as well. So if you're looking at this in the future, I don't know if they were still gonna change stuff. Maybe some things are missing or they, they swapped them around or something. Um, I'm using a test build of 2.779 at this point. Um, so yeah, anyway, let's get on with it. So let's say you wanna do stuff, um, you wanna add things like scuffs, for example, to this and uh, maybe some scratches or something like that. So let's see what we can do using procedural shaders to actually make that happen. So there's a couple of things that I really like using and one of them is the um, geometry node and the input. So you can do some really cool stuff. One of the main ones that is known that I use a lot is the pointiness and if we put a color ramp in here, now this is dependent on the type of geometry that you have and uh, the amount of polygons that you have. So if you wanna increase the, uh, let's see if we pull this here and you can see the pointiness does some really interesting things. It's gonna sort of look for the sharp edges of your mesh and then use those. Uh, and by piping it through a color ramp, you get a lot, a lot of control, but it's not perfect. Um, like I said, it depends on the resolution of your mesh. And you can sometimes get these little weird artifacts that uh, aren't always as easy to get around. You can really, really um, boost the levels of your um, subsurface shader, but there's really no point going past a certain level. Um, if it doesn't look good, then you're gonna have to paint it in or you can do it using vertex colors. Uh, there's a method called dirty vertex colors. If you Google that, you, I'm sure you can find it, but I wanna keep this uh, keep this with the pointiness for the sake of it. I'm gonna bring this back down to three levels, but it's just, it goes to show that if you're using this pointiness and you hit render on your final render and it looks different, make sure that all your subdivisions look the same um, so you can work on the final project because it is res uh, mesh resolution dependent. But with that said, now we have all these edges of our mesh isolated. And what we can do is if we just do this, Bring this in a little bit more. And you can flip it around, do whatever you want with it. But I'm just gonna use this as a mask for um, a scratches shader. So I'm gonna bring in a mix shader. All right, there we go. Pipe the principled into the first one and then I'm gonna make a second principled shader. There we go, I'm gonna set this to metallic. Put this in and now we get these cool sort of metallic accents and edges. Now, this is too perfect. I wanna break this up a little bit 
So I'm gonna have to start mixing these textures together. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna grab, let's say, let's grab Voronoi texture, see what we can do with that. Um, set it to object mapping. And uh, there we go. Now what I'm gonna do is flip this one around. Actually, I've gotta to go to converter color ramp. And let's see. Actually, I don't want to flip it around. I want to use these edges as scratches. Let's see if we can get them out at all. Maybe something like that. And again, I'm going quite quick here. Um, obviously, you can do a lot more stuff with this. And uh, what I'd like to do is maybe use a um, Musgrave or a noise map. I'm just going to stick with the noise for now. Noise, 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 where art thou? Noise texture, again, we can pipe in these coordinates. Add in the vector math node. Bring these in. And now we get sort of scratched looking surfaces. Um, you could even mess with the scale here to see if you can get scratches. Now these are a little bit more elongated and you can mix them in different um, in different directions if you wanted to. So I just have some basic scratches. Maybe I don't want them to be vertical but more horizontal. Let's see what we can do about that. They're a little bit more horizontal. There we go, something like that maybe. Might be a bit much. There we go. And this is just very simple. Um, by playing around with these coordinates, we know that our object's coordinates are being uh, done in the middle. Again, with the scale, uh, scaling down actually scales up, so it's gonna stretch it out. And uh, a higher number is actually gonna scale it down. So what have I done? I've basically compressed everything on the Z axis and uh, on the X and Y axis. So going front to back and left to right, I've stretched it out. So this is why we're getting these lines. And uh, now we could do, and this is just the Voronoi texture by itself with the noise texture um, being added into the uh, coordinates here. Now what we could do is bring in a mix RGB node and this guy is gonna be your best friend as well. If you've ever used something like Photoshop or GIMP or Krita or any sort of 2D, um, most 2D applications for drawing and painting and things like that, you have a bunch of blending nodes, uh, blending modes, sorry. So, or blend types in Blender. Um, you really want to be get to know these, but the most important ones for me that I use a lot is uh, the multiply node, which basically what it's going to do, if I set this factor to one, it's going to grab whatever you put into the first place and then multiply it by the second one. Now, that seems a little weird for colors, but when I talked about colors before in the compositing um, episode, colors are just math. So if we multiply a white color here by zero, which is the black color here, you're gonna get zero. So basically what we're doing here is anything that is white uh, from those scratches is gonna let the color through. So now we're gonna get more interesting results because now we have these scratched areas around the edges of our mesh. Now obviously, if you want these to look perfect, you're gonna have to put in a little bit more time and start messing with these coordinates a little bit more. But this just goes to show that you can do this kind of stuff very easily. And uh, even if we bring the roughness up and maybe mess with these a little bit more, there we go. You can see, you can start getting some nice patterns around the mesh. So that's that, that's the pointiness node and what you can do with it. And obviously if we have more pointy um, meshes, then you can really grab the very, very fine edges of these. It's just because Suzanne is a very rounded object um, that we don't get very hard edges. But again, it's all down to using the color ramp. Now, before I move on, there's one more thing that I wanna talk about as well. And I'm just gonna use a very simple texture for this. And that is the position node. If we pipe the position node into the vector of any texture, then what we get is what are called world coordinates. So that means if I were to move this object to the left and right, the, um, or any, any direction really, you can see that the texture actually stays in place and um, in relation to the world and the object moves around. So what could, be, what could this be very uh, handy for? Well, basically, let's say you're doing something like you're scattering particles and you want them to look different um, 
but uh, you don't want to go in and UV each individual particle or trying to find a way to make it work. What you can use is these, if they're static particles and they're not going to move, something like trees or whatever. If I bump up the scale on this, for example, and I pipe in a color ramp, where are we? color ramp, then um, what you could do is you can add in a little bit of color. So let's say you have trees and you want them to be like from sort of brownish or um, maybe orangish brownish to green and you want the leaves to have sort of different colors depending on where they are then you could add a lot of really extra really cool extra detail in by using the position node because then when you scatter them they're just going to grab uh, a, a random point in the position of where they are and they'll actually look really nice because you're going to get all these different intricate variations without actually having to lift a finger so this is why i like a lot of these coordinates um, because between the UV object and position, you can do so many crazy things with them and really speed up your workflow. Um, for example, if I were to give this Suzanne here the same material, then you'll see that the material, uh, the texture isn't actually the same for the two different ones. So that's what I meant by it. You can just use it to texture um, similar, like objects of a similar fashion um, with sort of the same looking shaders and textures, but have them be unique depending on the position of where they are in the world. It's so a huge plus, plus for things like um, static uh, environment models or anything like that. And remember, if you if these are UV'd, you can bake all of this down um, so you can get really infinite variations by just using procedural textures. So that's something that I really enjoy um, because of it. And I'm gonna get down to the last one now. And this one's a little bit more intricate, but um, I have a, a nice sort of extra example to show you. And this last one is all about the light paths. Now, light paths in Blender are very, I've found quite misunderstood by, by some people, but you can do some really, really interesting things with them. Um, for example, I have this very basic diffuse shader um, and it's nothing special, it's just a white, shader. Um, let's say I'm going to make this shader red. And this is very, very crazy red, but you get the idea. Um, all it does is Suzanne is just a red uh, diffuse head now. What can we do by using light paths to mix stuff in? If we go to this mix shader over here and we add a light path from the input menu, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff. So if I were to use this camera ray, then what I can do is basically I can tell Blender that um, this shader is now diffuse to everything but the camera. Now, because I haven't plugged a second one into here, uh, I'm not gonna get any results. So what happens if I plug an emission shader in here, for example, which is green, then you can see there's still sort of a red tinge because we're telling Blender that for all intents and purposes, this shader is a red diffuse shader, except for when the camera sees it. Then it has to be a green emission shader for some reason. Now, this is handy for a lot of things. For example, if we use something else, um, and we use, let's say, the glossy ray, what is going to happen is if we really crank up this diffuse shader for uh, this emission shader, now this is a red monkey, but in the um, glossy reflections of the objects and the world around it, now all of a sudden this is going to be a green reflective shader. So you can do some really, really cool tricks with these by messing with them and doing some interesting stuff with them. So one of those um, things you can do, and this is just an implementation of something that's actually in the Blender docs um, that you can just read about, is I have this custom shader called um, Architectural Glass. And if we open it up, basically what it's doing is it's making sure that the shader lets through all the light it should let through, but it still looks like a glass shader. Now, why would you do this? Um, if we look at it here and we just put in the surface shader, it doesn't have any shadows or anything. The light passes right through. And if we're doing this for an architectural visualization, then um, it's really cool because, well, basically, we have glass that looks like glass, but our render isn't slowing down because of it. Um, because if you just use a regular glass shader, and we can use even the principle for this one again, and set the transmission to one, then even with the roughness down, you see there's some darkness happening there. 
And actually, if I set this to one, that probably won't be the case. But they'll look fairly similar. They're not exactly the same. But for architectural glass, what I really just want is the reflections, and that's it. I don't need any of the refracting or anything else, because generally I'm either going to use an HDRI as a background or I'm going to put my own background in, um, and that's only going to mess with things. So this is something that's really, really handy, and it's things like these little speed-ups that can really make your workflow very quick. And as I said, it's a very simple node setup. It just uses the light paths. Um, of the shadow and reflection rays and all it's basically saying is this is glass for all intents and purposes unless we're talking about uh, something like shadow uh, and we want to just take out the shadow rays and basically mix the transparent shader over here together with the glass shader pipe them out and that's it and now we have this really efficient glass shader and as you can see there's nothing going on around here it's just a single it's meant for like a single plane uh, working really nicely shader so that's one of the things you can do with it. Uh, another really nice example is another shader that I created myself, is this hologram shader, which I talked about a little bit in the previous video. Um, and some of the things that I did with these light paths is, if I just turn on the back facing here and set the opacity to one, maybe the strength to five. If I change the color over here, let's change it to red so you can really see what's going on. Basically, now, for all intents and purposes, this is an emission shader, but it's actually not emitting lighting. And the reason I sometimes turn this off is because if you're using meshes to light things in your scene and cycles, it can get really, really noisy. And I sort of want to counter, wanted to counteract that by creating a shader where I could turn off the lighting. And this is, while this one is a little bit more complex, but if you take it, if I take it through, uh, if I take you to, uh, through it very quickly. Um, Basically what it's doing is I have this lighting over here and I'm using the, let's see, I haven't opened this in a while. So lighting goes down here. And basically this is just a mix factor between two shaders. I'm not even using the light paths for these, um, even though I probably could, and there's probably somebody cringing, but um, basically what's happening, I'm mixing a shader that has no lighting with a shader that does have lighting. And um, because of that, there we go, I can uh, turn it on and off as I see fit, or I can just have the lighting contribute a little bit. Let's say I set this up really, really, really high, or like maybe even 500, just to go completely overboard. But if I set this lighting up, this is way too bright. I just want this to look very bright, but not really contribute to the lighting all that much. I can tone it down, and as you'll see, um, the closer I get to zero, the less lighting is actually around all around. So. This is something that you can do and you can really mess around with and do some interesting things with. Same with this um, geometry node, which we talked about with the pointiness here. I wanna talk about the back facing, for example, as well. So I'm gonna set this back to one and 0.5 on the opacity. Let's say I wanna make a hologram. And uh, now what I'm getting is I'm seeing a lot of the other faces poking through and I don't really want that. Maybe what I want is to turn off the back facing faces and actually can do that. So I have two shaders and now only the front facing polygons will actually emit light. Now we have some overlap here between front facing. So that's why we're still getting these effects. But if you're using this on all kinds of um, weird little things, like let's say if I build this round cube mesh very quickly, I sort of use the same shader on it. So material three. What you can see is now, if I just solo this very quickly, we get a nice little result. Um, if I turn, turn on the back facing, it's not gonna make much of a difference until we bring the uh, environment back in. Now you can see, here's the back facing. Let me just move it over a little bit. This is with back, back facing, so you can see the polygons in the back, and this is without. So you can create really one-sided shaders. Then I've got this Fresnel as well, um, which I can bring in to Fresnel everything. So. These shaders sort of evolve as I use them, and here you can see with and without back facing. So you can fix artifacts and things. And it's this level of control that you're really looking for when you're doing custom shading or when you're doing procedural shading and using all these little tricks. Um, a big trend that has been happening lately that I'm not the biggest fan of and that I find, um, you know, how should I say this without offending anybody? Um, one of the things that's been happening, and it's something that I used to have as well when I started out uh, and was learning shading, is all this physically correct stuff is great until it stops working for you. What do I mean by that? 
Um, basically, what's going on is that um, a lot of people are like, yeah, it has to be physically correct this, physically correct that. Yes, it does help you on the way, but sometimes you just need something weird of out of the, or out of the ordinary or more performant. And that's where stuff like this uh, architectural glass come in or this hologram shader come in. So suddenly you need stuff for specific use cases. So that's why I like to sort of be on top of these kinds of things. So for example, if we set this back to camera right now, so you have a good idea and swap these two around. What is happening is it's going to emit light, green light. It's going to reflect green. It's going to be, um, if you're going to put a, let's say, like a glass object in front of this, it's going to get reflect the green light and everything and let it through. But to our camera, this is just a red diffuse shader. So you can do really weird stuff with this. And it's important to understand how all of this works in cycles um, because that way you, uh, you get a really good... Um, I guess, place and technical know-how to start working from, which means you'll be able to solve problems a lot quicker. Um, you'll be able to do some really crazy stuff a lot quicker. And in general, it's just a lot of fun. So I'm just gonna do a quick recap of what we did. So in the first uh, shader, we learned how to use textures to affect other textures, um, how the different mappings work inside of Blender and how we can go really, really crazy with them and do really cool stuff with them. Um, then in the second one, we talked a little bit about the pointiness and how to mix different maps together and using the RGB mix nodes to uh, mix different colors and different shaders together and do cool stuff with them. And in the last one, we talked about light paths and um, how we can use those uh, and the back facing stuff and how we can use those to build really cool custom shaders. So I hope that was um, enlightening to some of you. Um, one of the reasons I got into procedural shading is because I'm a very lazy person and I really don't enjoy UVing very much and UV unwrapping. So that's sort of how it evolved for me. Um, I can do it if I need to, obviously. And for game engines and things, you're going to still have to do it. But um, even if you're working in the game industry, you can use this because, uh, like I said, you can bake it all down to UVs and then bring it into another application, do cool stuff with it. So. I think I've said everything I wanted to say. Um, actually, there's one last thing I want to talk about. That's something that I forgot as well. Um, and this is just a very simple concept that you can do cool stuff with as well to give you even more control and even extra things. Um, in the converter node, it's a very quick last one. We have the separate RGB node. And I'm gonna use the color, the noise texture over here very quickly. As you can see, the noise texture has a bunch of different colors running through it, unless you use the factor output, which is just black and white. I'm gonna use the color one for here. Sometimes you might get textures and um, you wanna separate out and you wanna use different parts of it. Well, by using the separate RGB node, what you can do, you can separate the red, green, and blue component. So now you have um, the same texture that is basically outputting three different maps, which means you could use these three maps and then maybe throw them through a color ramp. So let's see, let's say if we increase the, uh, there we go, increase this one and maybe make it pink. And then you can do the same thing for the green, only we wanna do the green, we wanna flip it around and make it that kind of color bluish. And then we're just gonna mix these together very quickly. There we go, there we go. And by mixing them together now, I have this one texture that actually messes with these two colors and you can get really cool, intricate results. So it's all about finding new and crazy ways to combine these. And what you even could do is grab the screen part and use that as the mix factor. And then um, what you could see is if we throw the color ramp in between here. Go. We add this in. Now we get even crazier stuff because we're using the green channel to mix these together. So it's not really a question of knowing everything because now if I bring the scale up, look at this crazy psychedelic stuff going on. If we pipe this into the principle, now we get a really crazy shader that um, all is built from just this one noise map and that's it. It's not even being affected by other stuff, but just by separating out the red, green, and blue channels, you can do stuff like that as well. Um, so all of this stuff, it all works together and don't be freaked out by the complexity of it because as you've seen, I build these one by one. I do it step by step and I do this with everything that I do. Um, 
And if we want to go even further, if we have this Musgrave texture here, it's all about grabbing these now, mix RGB, and you can probably already tell what I'm going to do, and then mix these two together using this output that we created before. And now we have this super crazy psychedelic texture, and uh, it works beautifully. And we can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. So like I said, do it step by step. That's the most important part. Explore some of these textures, see what you can do with them, mess with the texture coordinates, because let's say if I scale this up now, then I don't know how many things it's going to affect. Oh, we're using UV coordinates. So the Z axis is um, redundant when using UV coordinates because there's not actually three axes because UV is 2D, so you've only got the X and Y scale. So let's say if I scale this up, so that means I'm gonna crunch it down. Um, then using these coordinates, now we get this really cool result, um, really crazy, all these crazy colors. So that's it for me. Um, I think I've said everything now. Sorry for that little last bit. Um, but as you can see, this stuff, I don't build it all at once. I try to combine stuff. I try to think about what I can do, how I can combine different things, and then uh, start using them. So all of these techniques as well. Uh, let's say I want to change this up a little bit, and I want to use this color. There we go. And I'm going to stick this in a color ramp as well. So now we have this black and white map. If I pipe this into the multiply value here, then now we can even have a bump map that corresponds to our, um, as you can see, to, to the map itself. So this is almost looking like paint running through each other. So um, that wasn't really what I set out to do. But as you can see here, the bumps are corresponding to it. And you can, you can use these maps in, let's say, the roughness slot as well, or the anisotropic slot, and all the different slots, and you can do the same thing. So now everything that is pushing out will be rough, and everything that's pushing it will be a little bit more, um, a little bit more shiny. But like I said, it's all about just combining, combining, combining. And that is the, the biggest thing that I want to want you to take away from both this lesson and the last is just experiment break the rules it doesn't matter um if it looks good then that's it don't worry about it and once you get better you'll find ways to optimize it you'll find different types of um i guess yeah different ways of working and um you'll find some techniques that you really like and you can really use so with that said that's about it for me um I hope this was interesting, but this just gives you an insight into how I do procedural stuff when it comes to texturing. Um, and you have a couple of examples you can look at here in the file as well. So that's it for me, uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.